channel open. Welcome back to Weekly Trek, a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions podcast network and presented in partnership with TrekCore.com. I am your host, Alex Perry. What's today's date? The date. Today's show was recorded on October 29th, 2021, and is current through the Star Trek Prodigy pilot episode, Lost and Found. So beware of spoilers. And if you are in one of the regions where Star Trek Prodigy has not yet aired and you are trying to stay spoiler free, be sure to check out the episode article on Trek Core for time codes for each of our stories tonight to avoid them. But I will say this episode three out of four of the stories are Prodigy related. What we're feeling good about is going to be Prodigy. So if you haven't seen Prodigy, I would say give this episode a miss. All right, let's get into the show. Good day, Voyager, and welcome to A Briefing with Neelix. It's a catchy title, isn't it? Weekly Trek is a 40-minute news show covering the biggest stories from the Star Trek franchise. We are in a new golden age of Star Trek. There are multiple television shows in production, possibly more on the way, and enough merchandise to fill the Bajoran wormhole. So stick with me and I'll help you sort the real facts from a lot of the Dominion propaganda that you'll find online. But I can't do this alone. And my guest this week is returning guest, Carlos Miranda. Carlos, welcome back to Weekly Trek. Uh, Thank you very much for having me, Alex. It is an absolute pleasure, particularly this week of all weeks, to be back on the show, man. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, Carlos, you know the drill. I want to know something that's got you excited about Star Trek at the moment. What's got you moving at Warp 10? Oh, it's, you know, it's, there's not a lot going on right now in Star Trek. (laughs) I don't know. To be perfectly honest, man, I mean, I always want to get creative every time I'm on a podcast talking about Star Trek, but we got to be just super basic this week, man. We got a new Star Trek series yesterday. So what's got me excited? The, The fact that we have a brand new Star Trek series that just premiered. I'm over the moon. And I love the fact that it's a kid's show, it's beautiful. I'm What's got me excited? Star Trek Prodigy has got me excited, dude. Yeah, me too. I mean, what else could it be after this week? It's a terrific premiere. It's a great show. Just there's so much about it that is just really, really fun. And hey, it seems like it's hitting with fans of all ages, which is exactly what we wanted, right? I mean, 100%. The idea of I think Kurtzman's kind of approach to Star Trek, which is very, very different, you know, to like Berman. And this is not a critique at all because Berman era Star Trek is my comfort food, right? And I love the fact that like stylistically DS9 looks and feels in many ways comparable to TNG, to Voyager, to Enterprise. There's a certain level of continuity, both in front and behind the camera of all of those shows. And I love that. But Kurtzman's approach of like, no, every single show is basically going to be in a different genre and it's going to feel different and it's going to look different. And Lower Decks is an adult cartoon and Prodigy is a kid's cartoon and you have Picard, a drama and Discovery action adventure. Like I just, I'm in, I'm here for it and I love it. And I'm just extremely excited to have a show that I can watch with my, uh, as you know, my very uninterested in Star Trek nine-year-old twins. Well, speaking of which, you were kind enough to do, uh, I mean, uh, we are both men approaching or firmly ensconced in middle-aged, and so uh, we are not the target demographic for Star Trek Prodigy, but your children are, and so you had the opportunity to ask them a little bit about what they thought about the show. We're going to play the recording of that little interview, but tee it up for us. What can we expect? Well, you know, like I said, my kids have never expressed any interest in Star Trek or even Star Wars, which was my other kind of love and obsession. With the exception of one episode that my daughter watched with me at like four in the morning, we were coming back from a family trip. We, we, we had been to Japan and we moved back to the UK. By the way, it's amazing that the American on the show is based in the UK and uh, <laughs> the British sounding guy is based in the, in the US. I know. But at four o'clock in the morning, I was up and I watched an episode of Voyager and my daughter came came down and she watched an entire episode of Voyager with me, asked a lot of questions about Janeway. And then aside from that one 44 minute interlude, neither of them have ever been interested in Star Trek. However, they do love animated cartoons. They, my son in particular, so I have a son and daughter named Theo and Lola, and they are nine years old. They are twins and they're great. And Theo loves Troll Hunters, like loves all of those tales of Arcadia type. You know, he's watched every single one of them, the movies, the crossover shows, he loves them. So I had to like tee it up a little bit and hype it up about like these were the same guys and it was a Star Trek show in for kids and I was really excited. So there was little to no resistance in terms of watching it. There was uh, resistance was not futile in this case. And they just like, like they were into it and 
you know, put it on and they loved it. We're in, actually, we're technically in, well, we are in New York right now. So we were able to watch it on Paramount Plus at my parents' house. And we're very lucky in that sense. But they loved it. And they really, you know, they really engaged with it. And they asked a lot of questions while we were watching it. You know, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, the kind of the callbacks to the other shows meant absolutely nothing to them. You know, I got super excited when we see it, when we saw it, Kazon. I mean, Hell come yeah. on, right? The Kazon uh, Renaissance. The Kazon Renaissance. I'll play, I mean, <laughs> on what planet is that? Literally on what planet is that even a thing that we're like going through? What? <laughs> you know? But like, I got so excited about all of those, you know, callbacks and the, all the Easter eggs throughout. And they were just into it. And I, you know, I love the fact that it had a little bit of like, it did feel, and this is not a critique, it did feel there was an element of like Star Wars Rebels and Clone Wars in terms of the, how fast the show was. There was definitely a little bit of that kind of Kelvin timeline aesthetic in the in, in the protostar, which is which I think is amazing looking in the music. So it just felt like an amalgamation of, you know, these very contemporary takes on track aimed at kid audiences. And that was a very long way of teeing up that interview. But let me just say that they were into it and they loved it. And this is what they said. Hi, Theo and Lola. Hi. Okay, we've just finished watching the premiere of... Star Trek, Trek Prodigy. Oh my God. Is this your first Star Trek series? Yes. Amazing. Okay, how old are you guys? Nine. And so I think this is the first Star Trek show made for you guys. And you guys are the target audience, right? So you're nine years old. What does that mean? That means that the show is really made for kids, right? For kids like your age. Did you like the show? Yes. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you think it was exciting? Yes. Yeah. What was your favorite part of the first episode? Uh, I liked it when the slime Murph pressed the gun button. The pew, pew, pew? Mm-hmm. What, what are they called? The pew, the pew, pew. All right, but what are they, do you know what they're called? Phasers? Mm-hmm. Amazing. Theo, what was your favorite part? My favorite part was when they negotiated the engineer into going. He said, I'm not going. And then in the end, he said, I'm going. Amazing. What, who's your favorite character, Lola? Murph. Murph? What, would, what about you, Theo? Who's your favorite character? Murph. Murph. So we got two Murph fans here. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm also going to go with Murph. So I think we got three Murph fans in the house. Are we looking forward to the next episode? Yeah. 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 Amazing. What do you think is going to happen in the series? They're going to go to they're lots gonna of different planets. They're going to destroy the... And have uh, lots of adventures. They're going to destroy the... What was it called? The prison place. Uh-huh. But what was the bad guy called? Do you remember? The... The Diviner. The Diviner. Yeah. Amazing. So are we looking forward to the next episode? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, there you go. That is the key audience right there for Star Trek Prodigy. So I think we're moving in the right direction. So with that, let's turn to the week's top stories. There's a war going on and I'm a reporter. In an interview published at The Hollywood Reporter, Star Trek franchise showrunner Alex Kurtzman and new Paramount Pictures CEO Brian Robbins, who was previously the head of Nickelodeon and gave Prodigy the green light, talked about their hopes and dreams for the show, which includes the possibility of more family-friendly series and a theatrical movie based on Star Trek Prodigy. I won't spoil them, but we've talked about a bunch of different ideas. If Prodigy is a success and works for everybody, then hopefully there will be lots of conversations about how to build it out from there because it's going to make sense for the company, Alex Kurtzman said. And when asked about how Prodigy's success could be measured, Brian Robbins said, quote, I have no doubt that we'll be doing more. Alex and I have talked about what the theatrical film version of this show is and the likes of that. We're really excited. And when pushed about whether that might mean a theatrical Prodigy movie, Kurtzman responded, potentially yes. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is still one of the best movies of the past decade, animated or not. It's just an unbelievable piece of artistry. I went with my whole family and another family, and we all sat there with our jaws on the floor. Ultimately, Star Trek is about family. It's about these giant universal themes. Getting to tell a story like that, especially given the level of cinema we've already brought to the television show, is a wonderful opportunity. It would thrill me to do that. The interview then pivoted away from Prodigy and animated Star Trek to talk about the future of Star Trek movies as a whole. And this is the part where things get, well, 
a lot vaguer. See if you can pass what this corporate gobbledygook means. Quote, where we go with the franchise next theatrically is crucial to the health of the overall franchise. There's no doubt that big theatrical movies are the beacon that ignite franchises. We're in it and I don't really have anything to say because I'm waiting for the development to be delivered. I can't wait to get going on it, but we're not there yet, but we need to get there soon. And perhaps most interestingly, when asked whether J.J. Abrams or Alex Kurtzman might shepherd Star Trek movies forward, Robin said, quote, We don't know enough yet. We're working on several fronts, and obviously Alex is the key for the franchise on Paramount+. Plus. J.J. has been the keeper of the franchise on the film side, and we hope that as a company that we do what's right for the franchise altogether. Carlos, what do you think about the prospect of more family-friendly Star Trek and the admittedly far-off potential, but seems like the potential nonetheless for an animated Star Trek prodigy movie? You now, I read this, and in no way, shape, or form is this surprising. If you, particularly if you have small kids, right? Like, if you if they watch anything on, like, the Disney Channel or, or Nickelodeon, and my kids are obsessed with a bunch of these shows, you know, all of these shows, the moment they're successful, have spin-out shows, and they all have, like, made-for-TV movies that may or may not be released theatrically. I mean, this is not something that like will be unique in any way, shape or form to Prodigy. And it's definitely not unique to Nickelodeon. So many of the new shows, um, you know, I'm thinking of like my kids are obsessed with a show called Loud House and Loud House is amazing. Like as a parent who watches a lot of kids shows with their kids, I love Loud House and Loud House spun out a show called Casa Grande, which is like the equivalent, but from like a Hispanic family. And now they've branched out into movies, right? So the show, can, Loud House continues, you know, Casa Grande continues. And now they're like working on their second th- theatrical movie. A hundred percent, you know, and again, the Disney Channel does exactly the same things. So this guy, Brian, obviously came from Nickelodeon and already has that model, a model that works. I could 100% see very easily how Prodigy spins out another show based on some of the same characters that go in a different direction. And then it turns into a series of, you know, maybe they're not theatrical movies, but they don't have to be. Turns out into a couple of like hour and a half uh, animated films. And it, they, they, they kind of create a little bit of a, I don't want to say MCU because we're talking about Star Trek, but like, you know, a little, a little universe of Star Trek prodigy kid-friendly shows like they've done with Tales of Arcadia and things like that. So I think it's not surprising. And I hope that they do it because the more content like this that my kids can get into, the more I can enjoy it with them. And that's, you know, as as Kurtzman said, it's all about family, right? Yeah. And I saw, you know, some of the initial reaction to this story, there was an element of, you know, well, the, you know, the pilot for Star Trek Prodigy has just aired, you know, isn't this sort of jumping the gun a little bit? And, you know, obviously I think they are going to want to kind of see and determine whether Prodigy itself is a success. But I think there's also an element for them too. And, you know, this is sort of kind of very directly related to what you said, which is if kids are into something, they want more of it. And because as a kid, you are constantly growing and evolving and your tastes are changing. If there is too long of a lead time between I really liked this and the next thing that kind of continues that enjoyment, it's potentially been too long and you've grown up too much and you've sort of moved away from it and are no longer necessarily as interested. And we know that these shows and these projects will have relatively long lead times to them. I mean, Prodigy was announced two years ago and it's now just hitting the screen. So if they want to do some of these other tie-in projects, if they find that Prodigy itself is a success, they're going to want to get going on them as quickly as possible to kind to capture the excitement of the audience who is participating and enjoying it right now. And so I think it is smart of them to be thinking now about what some of those options could be, because otherwise they potentially run the risk of missing the boat a little bit, given that to get a, an animated Star Trek Prodigy movie together might take two, three years. Yeah. And honestly, you know, these guys are talking to the press right now. There is no doubt that a lot of the development has already happened behind the scenes for a potential, and I'm making this up, right? I don't have any insider knowledge or anything, but knowing a little bit about the development process, particularly of animated films and animated series, on the one hand, like as you rightly pointed out, it takes years from conception and development to getting the first episode aired. So I would not be surprised if already somewhere in some vault, they have already decided what that Prodigy movie is all about and what, you know, the spinoff or spinoffs from Prodigy will be. They are just waiting for the data, right? And by that, I mean, all of it is taking place on platforms that they own, right? So they own all the data. They will see immediately in real time how many people watch Prodigy, how they were engaging with it. So they will make that decision. I wouldn't be surprised if in the coming weeks, they'll have pulled the trigger 
on to your point because they can't miss the boat, right? Kids will lose interest very quickly. They need a they need a prodigy season two, no doubt they're already working on. They need to know what the plan is for prodigy because it takes years. It isn't just like, okay, well, let's reuse some sets and shoot it. You're creating everything right. from scratch. Mm-hmm. So I would not be surprised if all of those decisions had already been made. They were just waiting for the, you know, the final data to make the decision because at the end of the day, it's a product. We don't think of it as a product, but it is there to make money. And if it's going to make them more money, they'll do it. And they do sort of say, I think Brian Robbins said in the interview, you know, the data on this show is going to be really easy and quick for us to get our hands on. And it's fairly clear cut as to whether this is something that's successful or not. And it it certainly sounds like from the tone of the interview, they feel fairly confident already at this stage that it's going to end up being a success. I mean, you'd never want to do an interview with the Hollywood Reporter in which you're raising the possibility of a prodigy animated movie if you're not kind of, you know, if you're not sort of leaning very strongly in that direction of doing something like that. So you're not faced with an interview two years from now where someone goes, oh, what happened to that Prodigy animated movie you talked about? And you go, oh, well, the show wasn't successful enough for that to happen. You know, these corporate types don't tend to, you know, they're not freewheeling. Often a lot of this is is fairly strategic and calculated in terms of what they say when. And this interview definitely has that kind of feeling to it. I mean, the fact that it went up right the day of the premiere sort of indicates that, you know, there is buzz and there is in interest in this show at the corporation that they're really looking to capitalize upon. And that's very exciting because so far what we've seen as a show is incredibly positive. Completely. I mean, I think everyone, you know, the reviews have been overwhelmingly positive people, I think at least on my Twitter feed, which is a very, I have to be honest, I curate it quite carefully. And so it's a very, very, you know, a very positive spin on Trek. And from everyone, you know, the review that you guys had up on Trek Core, like it's just, it's just a great show and it is what it is. I mean, I think you need to, this is not Berman Star Trek. This is not Voyager. You know what I mean? Like you have to go in knowing first and foremost that this is a show for kids. But if you go into it with that, it just works like all good, all good kid shows. It works for the kids, but it also works at, you know, for the parents that are forced sometimes against their will to watch <laughs> something over and over and over again. And, and I will say on a, on a meta level, I, I have been really pleased at the way in which a lot of the, you know, our slice of the Star Trek fan community have very much approached this show with that element of it being a kid show in mind, right? Like the Trek core reviewer for Prodigy is not me, a 34 year old man with no kids. It's Jen Tift who has three kids of her own who are right in the bullseye of the target audience. Uh, The Trek Geeks Network, they're discovering Trek companion show is going to be hosted by Mike Bovia and his daughter who are, again, his daughter's right in that kind of, is the intended audience for the show. And so it is really pleasing, you know, even the Trek movie uh, review, uh, of course, Anthony wrote it because he's done every one of every Star Trek episode since it came back in 2017. But at least, you know, he went out and found a couple of family members who have kids they could show it to and get some reaction from it so that has been really pleasing to me the way in which again (laughs) our well curated slice of the fan community who knows what's going on in the rest of the wild west but that in the circles that we move in they've definitely been approaching it from this sense of obviously you know you and i will enjoy the show it's a star trek show we love star trek and and it's a great show and so we'll enjoy it but in terms of like what the point of the show is and who the target audience is always being mindful of that and talking about it in that way is going to be really critical moving forward and hey hopefully we're talking about a lot more prodigy stuff in the you know months and years to come because this is a really exciting new kind of avenue for Star Trek to explore that you know I think could could yield some really significant results yeah correct yeah I I, I echo everything that you've said I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to the whole new kind of universe that Prodigy opens and we've just barely scratched the surface we haven't seen Chakotay and co you know what I mean right. like the fever pitch around the show is only going to get like louder and better Captain Janeway actress Kate Mulgrew who appeared at the end of the Prodigy pilot lost and found as Hologram Janeway spoke to a group of press, including TrekCore.com, at a recent roundtable about the show and her appearance as Janeway. About Hologram Janeway's role in Prodigy, she said, quote, Initially, she's there for the purposes of mentorship and guidance, but you soon come to understand that she is leading them in an unexpected way. 
I don't think I am allowed to tell you how that is. That's a spoiler. Suffice to say, the hologram is very much like Captain Janeway and has many of her traits and all of her better qualities. And the kids respond to those qualities accordingly. So it's not as if they're responding to some sort of machine. She also talked about how easy it was to return to Janeway in a voice acting role. Quote, it was easy, delightfully and refreshingly easy, which is a wonderful gift after having worked so hard for seven years to create the real Captain Janeway. To have her in my pocket like that and to have her spring out with such alacrity and such vivacity pleases me very much. It's a pleasure. And at this point in time, 26 years later, it should be nothing short of a pleasure. And on her influence on the design for animated Janeway, Kate Mulgrew said, quote, we were in very close collaboration because it's important to me that my physical features be exaggerated in just the right way. It's easy to get that wrong. But these animators did beautifully, so that the eyes are a little enhanced, the face itself is a little shortened, a little square, the mouth is more facile. Children need to respond to the eyes and the mouth, every inch and step of the way, from the hair, which you know was diabolically difficult for real Janeway, and these guys, Kevin and Dan Hageman, are just terrific to work with. Carlos, we obviously only got a very brief glimpse of hologram Janeway at the end of the pilot. Are you looking forward to seeing more of Kate Mulgrew's hologram Janeway next week? I mean, come on, what's going to be the end? to that of course <laughs> i think i think we are you know you said earlier we are 100 in the golden age of star or a new golden age of star trek my friend steven and i wrote an article we co-authored an article for trek news i mean before disco came out so like i don't know in 20 early 2017 talking about how like if discovery is successful it will usher in a new golden era of star trek and you know it wasn't like it wasn't some uh we, you didn't need to be like have the intelligence of a q or anything it was very obvious but it's amazing that we're actually in it right and to me you know what's really amazing about this new golden age of star trek and i'm so excited for this is and i'm very surprised by this not in a bad way but how much basically every new incarnation of star trek is serving in some roundabout way as a sequel to voyager which have right. never in a million yeah. years. I'm uh -huh. like, what? You're bringing back, you know, we in a span of a few months, we have two major kind of points of, of two different shows with Kazon. You know, we're bringing back Tom Paris, obviously, you know, Seven and Picard, but we got Echeb, we're getting Chakotay, like obviously Janeway, you know, we get the Voyager, Jay in Disco. Like yep. it is amazing to me. Truly, truly wonderful and amazing that there is this like love for Voyager and all every new show is the element of that new show is serving as a sequel to what, what happened on Voyager and I'm here for it and I love Janeway I think in many ways Janeway is my favorite captain I think it's definitely the captain that I'm most like in in a lot of ways if I had to choose and so to me I, I love Kate Mulgrew I think she speaks about Janeway with such I think passion is the best word. Like she really, you know, you, you kind of have a hard time divorcing Kate Mulgrew from Janeway. Obviously, yeah. she's an amazing actress, but you could really see Janeway just being a heightened version of Kate Mulgrew in many ways. Uh, and I mean that lovingly. And I think mm -hmm. it's amazing. And I think I have all I have a lot of respect and love for Kate Mulgrew and Janeway as a character. So I am 100% here for it. I love the fact that, you know, she's a hologram, but it's still going to be Janeway. The pictures of the hologram drinking coffee, yeah, as someone who's coffee obsessed and loves coffee, <laughs> is so exciting to me. So yes, I'm excited to see more. I want to see Captain Chakotay. I want to see where they're going with everything. I'm here for it 100%. Yeah, I really like the way in the pilot, and then I'm assuming this will continue into episode three as well. They have sort of been dialing up the, what's the best way of putting this? Star Trekiness of the show, right. right? Like the pilot begins on Tars Lamora, this, you know, asteroid penal colony. And there are kind of sort of Star trek -y hints, right? You've got the Kazon and you get that little flashback of Zero, the Medusin in the box. But overall, in that kind of very initial, you know, sort of 10, 15, 20 minutes of the episode, it does have a bit more of a generic kind of sci-fi sort of milieu with Star Trek hints to it. But then Correct. when they hit the starship and it's like, 
you know, we find the protostar and we go aboard and then you get a bit more of that kind of, you know, you know, a bit more of the L cars and a bit more of the sort of Starfleet and Federation iconography. And then you get towards the end of the episode and, you know, sort of the throughout the episode, you know, it begins with kind of an every man for himself mentality. And then by the end of the episode, it's very much sort of like, no, you know, we're only going to get out of this if we work together style, which of course is a very Star Trek message. And then you hit the end of the episode and hologram Janeway appears it feels like in many ways it's sort of easing the audience into that sort of Star Trek milieu without kind of hitting you straight off of the bat with a starship and a bridge and you know all of those kind of sort of features that we otherwise would be really familiar and comfortable with but that the younger audience I think you know needs a little bit of time to build up to and I think now going into that third episode being on the ship being off off the asteroid the possibility of going anywhere and having hologram Janeway at their side. Like, I think the next episode is going to feel even more Star Trekky than the first episode did. And I think that's exactly what they wanted to happen. No, I agree. I think, I think that they wanted to, you know, they didn't want to scare potential new audiences by making it too Star Trekky at the beginning. You got to ease them in. Right. And I think that generic sci fi, almost Star Wars, the approach yeah. uh, was really smart. But, you know, it had it was peppered with little Star Trek things here and there. And mm-hmm. by the and to your point, by the t- time they hit the protostar, which as an aside, I love kind of late 24th century aesthetics. Right. The, the way Dax geeked out about 23rd century aesthetics is the yep. way I freak out I love about 21st century aesthetics. Sure. And I just whenever they design a new starship that takes place in that timeline and they knock it out of the park. Like, I think the protostar is stunning. Like, I cannot wait for the Eagle Moths, you know, version. I can't. I can't wait. And whether my kids want it or not, I'm buying them each one. (laughs) And I'm just excited for it. And so I do think that we will get a lot more Star Trekiness sooner rather than later. And then I think they'll eventually land somewhere where it's Star Trekky for those that want it to be Star Trekky, but then generic sci-fi enough for those that are a little bit overwhelmed by the history and the legacy of, of the franchise. And I think given the Star Wars franchise beat Star Trek to the attention of many of these younger viewers with Rebels and Clone Wars and Bad Batch and Resistance, in some ways Star Trek does sort of have to say, hey, if you are a kid who enjoyed these shows, this is going to be a bit different but like not that different and we'll kind of ease you into it and we'll show you you know the things about those Star Wars shows that you liked and then start to kind of build in some of these kind of different concepts and ideas that kind of, that will make the show sort of stand on its own I mean I think that's a very smart way of ultimately you know sort of saying hey if you younger viewer are a fan of X let me introduce you to Y and give you this what will ultimately end up being a slightly different experience but not so different that you're not going to want to make that crossover. Yeah, correct. I agree with that. And in another exciting development, Star Trek Prodigy fans won't have to wait a full year for the show's soundtrack like Lower Decks fans just did because the soundtrack to Star Trek Prodigy will be releasing weekly with a selection of music from each episode of the series, which will culminate in a complete season one soundtrack release at the end of the season. The score for the pilot episode Lost and Found by the franchise's first female composer, Nami Melamad, is available right now for purchase or streaming on all major music platforms. In fact, as I was writing the exact script that I'm reading out right now, I was listening to that music. Carlos, did you enjoy the music for Star Trek Prodigy's pilot? The music was amazing. Like, but like way better that any hand, that it had any right to be like for a kids animated show mm-hmm. it was amazing like i loved it and i thought about the musical well it was you know, a lot of times when you're watching a show you're really into the story and the music is ambient noise it's very good it heightens it but it, it doesn't take the front seat you don't necessarily yeah. want it to take the front seat but actually it was amazing it like it, it felt like it, it felt like you were listening to like a massive film score at times. And I was so here for it. I am someone that listens to, I listen to basically three or four soundtracks while I'm working a lot of the Mm -hmm. time. Three out of the four will not be surprising to anybody. I have the Star Trek First Contact soundtrack on repeat, the motion picture soundtrack on repeat, which in some ways are basically exactly the same. Yeah, good choices. Star Trek Generations, oh my God. Yep. When I was studying for my UK driver's license, I just listened to the Star Trek Generations like soundtrack on repeat for a long time because <laughs> I, 
I failed my I failed my my first written exam once and my my practical. So there was a lot of studying. And then last but not least, I went and the Thor Ragnarok soundtrack is my other one. I love the Thor Ragnarok soundtrack. Strongly recommend it to anybody out there. But I loved it. And so I look forward to kind of having adding prodigy as enjoyable background music because I was really extremely impressed with it. Yeah, it really was good. I mean, I, you know, we had we had sort of heard the the theme from Michael Giacchino prior to the show being released, but you know, he composed the main title theme but not the kind of episodic scores that was done by Nami Melamad. And she does a really terrific job here. I mean, again, the the sort of music when they find the proto star and they're going aboard is so full of wonder and potential and possibility for what the adventures for these characters could be. There are some really nice uses of the sort of Alexander Courage kind of, you know, famous Star Trek flourish throughout that really kind of ground you in this being a Star Trek show. And even though, and we talked a bit about this in the episode last week in an interview Melomad had said that there's not really much use of the Voyager theme throughout the show yes there was not you know it's not like you heard the kind of famous you know Jerry Goldsmith Voyager kind of theme in the way that you did when Seven showed up on Picard with Jeff Russo's composition for that show but at the same time while you didn't hear the exact notes and the exact combination there was a lot that felt very Voyager-y about the music and, and that was really nice and a really nice sort of continuation with this sort of serving as something of a spiritual sequel to that show. Oh, completely. And by the way, I mean, you called it out. I think one of the finest pieces of music from Picard, and I mean, that entire show is gorgeous from a, in terms of soundtrack, but in Stardust City Rag, when Picard and Seven are talking about their experiences with the Borg and the Voyager theme is slowly playing in the background, I think it was one of my like absolute favorite moments of kind of new Trek. And I think it's amazing how much that music, that Voyager theme or any of those old, old themes that we grew up with, how much the nostalgia that bubbles up inside of you and the emotion that they force is, is amazing. And lastly, this week, following up on last week's story about the center seat documentary, we actually now have a release date for the 10 part Star Trek documentary that will premiere on the history channel. Center seat debuts on the history channel on November 5th. Yes. That's later this week from the time that you're listening to this episode on the History Channel. It will run on History for the first four episodes out of the 10 and then transition over to History's streaming service, History Vault, for the remaining six episodes of the documentary run. As discussed last week, the documentary will cover the Star Trek franchise from its inception through the end of Star Trek Enterprise. And with 10 episodes, it will hopefully be able to get into more depth on parts of the Star Trek franchise that have not been well covered in documentary format. Carlos, no. No sign of a UK release yet, but is this one that you think you'll check out when you have the chance? Look, dude, it's got Star Trek on it, so of course I'm going to check it out. <laughs> uh, like, literally, you know, I, I, I am not, like, I don't think that just because you put Star Trek on something that it's going to be high quality and I'm going to love it, right? Let's not talk about Star Trek Into Darkness, but <laughs> it, it's Star Trek, so immediately I'm going to check it out. I really thought the trailer, the first half of the trailer, you know, as someone who's been, I am 39 years old, I became obsessed with Star Trek when I was nine. So the same age as the twins are now. My first Star Trek convention, which by the way, I found autographs in a book that just like in the, my move, we just moved to Edinburgh. And in our my move, I found my very first two Star Trek autographs. Oh, one from Armin Shimmerman and one from Marina Sirtis. It was one of Armin Shimmerman's very first conventions. It took place between season six and seven of TNG and uh-huh. seasons one and two of... So I've been going to Star Trek conventions for 30 years, right? And I absolutely love it. That means, though, that I have read every... Especially behind the scenes Star Trek. I love behind the scenes Star Trek. So I always approach these as types of things of like, am I going to learn anything new? Not because, obviously, I wasn't there or anything, but like I've consumed so much. And you hear the same actors. You can only hear... Kate Mulgrew has certain stories that she talks about how hard it was for her to play in Janeway. And you see that in the trailer, like they repeat a lot of the same beats, which is great. Of course, I'm going to watch it. But then they kind of took a turn, which I was not expecting in the preview, where they start talking about kind of that it, it seems like it's going to be a warts and all. You know, the things that yeah. I find most interesting are like, you know, when you read stories of like what a blocker Gene Roddenberry was to Star Trek II to Star Trek Three, the things mm-hmm. that he was doing that were not probably 
very kosher, keep it as PG as possible, behind the scenes. And it seems like they're going to, at least from the trailer, that they're going to deep dive into some of the darker corners of behind the scenes Star Trek, which I always think are always the most interesting because it's not a happy, it has not always been a happy family that's making it, right? Yeah, I mean, I talked about this last week, so I won't rehash the points. I mean, I'm looking forward to this one. I think the new thing we learned this week, which was is a little frustrating, is that it's 10 episode season, first four episodes on the History Channel, back six on the History Channel's dedicated streaming service. Yeah, uh, yeah no thanks to that. <laughs> um, I think that's going to be one of those, like, sign up for the free trial, binge everything, and then cancel as quickly as possible type deals. I mean, obviously, I, I you know I understand why the network's probably doing that. But the frustrating thing for me, though, is probably those last six episodes that I personally actually want to see the most, right? Because the first four are going to be more focused on, like, TOS animated series. Series, TOS movies, just if like if if I if I had 10 episodes to go between Inception to Enterprise, you know, I think probably the first three, four are gonna cover like TOS movie era animated series, maybe the birth of the next generation. But honestly, those are probably the parts of Star Trek history that are most well sort of covered. It's the next generation through to the end of Enterprise period that I really want more on and that there's less documentaries about. And well, those are the episodes that are going to be on the History Channel streaming service. So I'm sure I'll suck it up in order to get access to them in some way, shape or form. But it, I don't think that's a streaming subscription I'm going to hold on to for very long. No, I, I completely agree. And, you know, I have an American iTunes account. So like those are the kinds of things that when they're available, I'll just buy them and watch them once. But, you know, I, I, I check it up to the experience of like going to the movies. Right. But yeah, I mean, I think that it's you know, this is a topic for another podcast, my friend. But like the streaming wars, you know, I'm just looking forward to they're just somebody to reinvent cable and you just pay a hundred bucks or whatever it is and then you have access to all of them that's it you know like like what is you know what i do in my day-to-day life i I run a technology company and you know the reality of it is that the old saying that every few weeks some tech bro reinvents the bus is 100 (laughs) percent true right and this is i'm i just i look forward to you know whatever company is going to kind of put all of these services under one easy payment. And yeah, it's a pain in the butt, but it is what it is. All right. Well, we've talked about the facts and now let's speculate on what's going to happen in the future of Star Trek. You make some very good points, Captain, but it's still all speculation and theory. So each week, I and my guest give you a wish or theory we're nurturing about any of the shows or the future of the franchise. So Carlos, I'd say your theory or wish for this week. My theory or wish, I'm going to say that we are going to get I talked about it earlier about Voyager, the sequel to Voyager, all of these shows acting in some way or another. I really think that Prodigy is going to lean really hard into Voyager. And I think that we are going to get a lot more surprises, Voyager related surprises that have already been announced. If you told me that the EMH shows up on the Protostar, yeah. wouldn't be surprised. You know, I think obviously we know Chakotay is now a captain and I think he's probably going to be looking for the Protostar. I wouldn't be surprised if we get Admiral Janeway. I think that these guys are such fans of Voyager. And so is, you know, Kurtzman and co that Prodigy in many, many ways, not just Janeway, but will actually lean into what is happening with the non-seven kind of characters of Voyager. And we're going to be pleasantly surprised. You know, are we going to see, are, is Neelix going to show up in the Delta Quadrant? Why not? Sure. So I really think they're going to, they're going to lean into the Voyager cast and crew in a massive, massive way. And we are going to see a lot more of uh, that cast and crew. Yeah, I think you are right. It certainly feels like it's kind of set up in that way, right? I mean, not just in terms of Hologram Janeway and Captain Chakotay, but Aaron Waltke, one of the writers of Prodigy, tweeted earlier that he didn't think anybody had found this particular Easter egg, which is Dal at one point says something about you told me about that cluster of stars the window of dreams which actually previously was mentioned in the episode body and soul from season seven of voyager the one where the doctor takes over seven of nine's body and as the i can't remember the name of the race but the like captain is trying to woo dr seven he takes her to a pulsar and he's like 
To an astronomer, it's simply a pulsar cluster, but to our poets call it the window of dreams, which implies that we obviously don't know where in the Delta Quadrant Prodigy takes place. We just know it's in the Delta Quadrant, right? Gwyn says this side of the Delta at one point in that pilot episode. But if it's anywhere close to where sort of season seven-ish of Voyager was taking place, well, Neelix is not all that far away. And, you know, I mean, what a perfect character to kind of pop up and have a role on a kid's Star Trek show. I mean, that's sort of what the character, kind of sort of the role that he served on Voyager and a role that he could serve very easily on Prodigy too. Yeah, correct. And it'll be exciting to see where they take us. All right. So let me give you my theory, which is I've not been able to stop thinking about this quote that I read out from that first interview with Brian Robbins and Alex Kurtzman when they were talking about Star Trek movies as a whole and Brian Robbins said, and I'll just read the quote one more time when he's asked about kind of the future of Star Trek movies more generally. He says, we don't know enough yet. We're working on several fronts and obviously Alex is the key for the franchise on Paramount+. Plus. JJ has been the key for the franchise on the film side. We hope that as a company, we do what's right for the franchise all together. Now, I am almost certainly just wish casting this and reading into it, but I couldn't help but walk away from that quote with a simmering undercurrent potentially of frustration by Paramount Pictures with J.J. Abrams in that Like, compare the track record of Alex Kurtzman and J.J. Abrams' involvement in the Star Trek franchise since Star Trek Beyond in 2016. Alex Kurtzman's put four Star Trek shows on the air and and five have been produced, because Strangely World's not come out yet. J.J. Abrams' production company has not managed to get a single Star Trek movie off of the ground since Star Trek Beyond premiered in 2016. You have to wonder if there isn't an element of frustration at the corporation about how they really want to get a Star Trek movie up on the air, but they've got their wunderkind over on the TV side who's just pumping out content left and right, and we've got bad robot over on the movie side who it seems like you know still have some kind of it certainly sounds like contractual involvement with Star Trek movies who for some reason just don't seem to be able to figure it out I mean partially that's almost certainly a result of bad luck and bad timing the Noah Hawley movie sound like it was going ahead but also sounded like it was about an intergalactic pandemic and so they cancelled it when the global pandemic started but there's also an element of like you know yes as J.J. Abrams is production company. But yes, it's also pretty obvious that he himself has been done with Star Trek since Star Trek Into Darkness premiered now almost 10 years ago. And that his mind is not on this franchise and it's other people in the company who are involved with the Star Trek piece of it. And I'm sure that Paramount is probably getting quite frustrated with that. And I, you know, the sort of that whole thing about we're trying to figure out what's right for the franchise. So to me had this element of JJ, what's right for the franchise is to you to sail off into the night and for us to give this to Alex Kurtzman at this point. I'm probably just wish casting on this. You know, supposedly we've still got a Star Trek movie coming in two years. Doesn't sound like from Brian Robbins though, but based off of that interview, that there's too much to kind of say or do about that. And like, if it's going to come out, I think it's July of 2023, like that movie has to go before the cameras in the next six months to be in a position to do that didn't kind of sound like they were moving in that direction based off of that interview. But anyway, that's my kind of thoughts and reflections. Carlos, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, you know, I agree with you. I mean, I also think that JJ, um, by the way, I mean, if JJ is due, I do think that Star Trek 09 is one of not just the great top five Star Trek movie ever. I think it's one of the most fun sci-fi action movies of the last 20 years. I adore everything about that movie, uh, which is why my heart is still so broken regarding Star Trek Into Darkness. I think that JJ's also pretty been burnt. I mean, I think from everything that you read about his experiences with Rise of Skywalker, I think JJ's probably at a place where he's like, look, I'm happy to shepherd a couple of other properties, but I'm just going to go do my own thing now. Obviously, that's all based on rumor, but there's a lot of it. So where there is a lot of smoke, there's probably some kind of fire, right? And I think, you know, I think it's fine if Bad Robot kind of moves on. They gave us three very different Star Trek movies. One, which I think is an absolute triumph. One, which which I think is an unmitigated disaster. And another that I just think is kind of meh. But, you know, that's just my personal opinion. You know, I I know a lot of people love Beyond. I'm so not, I'm not very keen on Beyond. But I think, would I love to see another movie in the Kelvin timeline? 
to be honest, I think too much time has passed. I love that crew. I love all of those actors. I think one of the best things JJ did is cast extremely likable actors in all of those roles. So would I be excited to kind of continue that story? Sure, I totally would. But kind of my affection isn't there. If you're telling me that Kurtzman is also going to take over the cinematic universe and whatever movie or movies you're starting to plan out take, you know, are either in a new era or relate to one or multiple of the shows that are currently happening, I would be probably more excited by that just because I think Star Trek on TV has just been firing on all cylinders. So it, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I do not think we're getting a Star Trek movie on that date. You know, um, Paramount just pushed back Indiana Jones by a year, um, and, you know, and that's going to be a massive tentpole movie that, they, that they're already, you know, filming um, and about to wrap in the coming months. So I don't think that we're getting another Star Trek movie for at least three years. And also I feel like the company probably is thinking, we have a really good thing going on with a TV unit. We don't need to rush something out on, on the film front. But, you know, let's see what happens. But I wouldn't be surprised if what they're angling for there is to get Kurtzman truly, you know, like they did with Berman back in the day, truly become the overlord of all Star Trek over all, you know, over any, you know, whatever medium it may be. Do you have a theory or a wish for Discovery, Picard, Strange New Worlds, Lower Decks, or Prodigy that you'd like to share? Tweet them to me at Weekly Trek or email them to me at Weekly Trek at the Tricorder Transmissions.com and I might feature your theory in a future episode. Well, that's all the time we've got for this episode of Weekly Trek. Thank you so much to my guest, Carlos Miranda, for joining me today. Carlos, how can people contact you if they want to continue the conversation? Uh, well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'd love to talk to people on Twitter, especially about Star Trek. And my handle is at Double Mac because my coffee order is a double macchiato. So hit me up on Twitter. I'd love to kind of banter uh, about Star Trek. And you can find this show on Twitter at Weekly Trek and me at Alexander T. Perry. And if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving us a five-star review on your podcast player of choice. And please check out some of the other great shows on the Tricorder Transmissions. And if you like our shows, please also consider becoming a Patreon of Tricorder, which you can find at patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions. And lastly, if you're looking for Star Trek news on the internet, I hope you will turn to trekcore.com. Well, thank you, Carlos. Thank you to all of my listeners. And until next week, live long and prosper. <laughs>